Hello and welcome to DM101. This is my new regular series where I try and help those of you who want to start getting into running games of Dungeons and Dragons or other tabletop role-playing games. You want to start being a dungeon master or a games master or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is just my kind of little series. I'm giving you tips and tricks and ha the way that I happen to do things. Who am I, you might be asking, if you're new to the show. My name is Mark Humes. I am the Dungeon Master for The High Rollers, which is a D&D stream over on twitch.tv forward slash yogscast. I'll put the video link in the description below. It seems to be a stream that people enjoy, so come on, give it a watch if you'd like to. Um, this series seems to be doing really well. People seem to be appreciating sort of some of the things, the topics I've been talking about. It seems to be helping a few people out there. So it's going to keep going. We're now going to start getting into the real meat and bones. This episode and the next few episodes are going to be focused all on creating your own homebrew worlds. Um, we're going to talk about adventures later, creating specific adventures for tabletop role-playing games. But I think it's almost better to start talking about the bigger picture, which is the homebrew world, and then go into the you know, minutia of adventures later on. And that means we'll be covering things about like building encounters and custom monsters and magic items and all that stuff down the road. Couple of things to go over before we start. First things first, I am going to refer a lot to Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. The reason I do that is because it's the system I know best. It's what I'm known for running. Um, it's what a lot of people come into the hobby playing. A lot of the advice, though, will apply to stuff like Pathfinder, um, Edge of the Empire, Fan Fan Fancy Flight style RPGs. You can use a lot of the advice and the thinking in almost any system or setting. Obviously, some of that will vary. Um, but yeah, it is primarily going to be focused on D&D 5th edition. So if I happen to say something like, you know, in D&D 5th edition X, Y and Z, try and find the equivalent, you know, in your particular system, etc. The other thing is I am not a published author. I am not, a, you know, a famous games designer. This is just my way of doing things. And I, by no means, are trying to t I'm trying to tell you that this is the only way or the right way of doing things. This is just the way I do it. It's here to give you ideas. It's here to kind of get you thinking, maybe kind of spark, oh, I could do that that way, or I've never tried it that way. Let me give it a go. See what works for you. One of my biggest things that I say in this series is... GMing and DMing is very much about experience and it's about finding what works for you and your group. Different groups want different things, different GMs, different DMs do things in different ways. So this is just my way of doing it. Um, it might not work good for you. It might work gooder for you. Words fail me today. Um, but that's it. That's what I wanted to, to just quickly cover in this little opening bit. I will put this in the timestamps below, but the topics we're going to be talking about today focus on the key idea, that your sort of your big idea or your your starting idea for that gets you set on the path of creating a homebrew world. Then we're going to be talking about key features or your campaign's unique selling points. Then we're going to be talking about world events. Um, which I think is quite integral to the foundations of your campaign. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the creation myth and why that can be important in D&D campaigns. And that's going to wrap up the episode. So let's just jump straight into it. Okay, so let's begin talking about building worlds and where you should start. The actual first thing I'm going to suggest is check out some of the world building uh, seminars and talks by popular authors, especially fantasy authors. You can find a lot of these on YouTube. One I'm going to personally recommend, not only because he is a favourite author of mine, but because I think his seminars are incredibly detailed and very useful. Look for Brandon Sanderson's seminars on creative writing and world building. Most of these you can find on YouTube, and they're actually where a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the next few episodes comes from. It's all stuff that I've learned from him or from other GMs and things like that. With that out of the way, where do we begin? For me, most of my Dungeons & Dragons campaigns have begun with an idea. Now, you might be thinking that's an idea for an epic story, you know, something of like, yeah, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And that's not true for me. Often, my ideas for campaigns come from much more mundane things. It might be the idea of a particular villain. It might be the idea of a government or a city uh, and how it's run. 
it might be the idea of a natural phenomenon or a you know a landmark yeah. I'm trying to think of what they're called. <laughs> uh, natural wonder, if you want to use the Civ terminology. It might be something like that. It might also be an event or things like that, a particular war. It could be something like uh, the Lightfall campaign for High Rollers, for example. The whole idea of that campaign, the, the, the starting point of that campaign, came from thinking, what if there was this cool magical disaster? You know, a magical natural disaster that occurred. Hmm, that's kind of an interesting thought. What could that be? What could have happened before then? And this is where those ideas, for me, form the best kind of like starting point as a campaign because you come up with a villain and you start might you might start asking questions like, okay, well, what's this villain trying to accomplish? If that's what that villain's trying to accomplish, what kind of world do they live in? What led them to want to have those ambitions? Well, where did this villain grow up? Who, was, who were their parents? Why did they turn out this way? If it starts with a natural event, it's like, well, what, what consequences did that have? What, what did people do before this new technology was discovered? Before this, you know, why is that city built there? Who does this city trade with? Who has this city been at war with? If this city is wonderful because it's built on a fantastic resource, people would surely come after it, right? Well, who's coming after it? Why? Who lives close enough by? To me, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but questions and their answers, that is where world building comes from. When you start taking an idea and you start asking questions and answering it and you write out the answer and or maybe you put it in a little note or you start just thinking about it, you start to get the ball process rolling and really that initial idea can be anything. A lot of people, I think, make the, not necessarily mistake, but they have the misconception that if you want to create a D&D campaign world or a homebrew world or a fantasy fiction world, you've got to have this incredibly detailed map in your head and you've got to know where everything goes and you've got to have this cool story of the beginning, the middle, the end and how it's all going to play out and how it's all going to connect and all the little twists and turns that you're going to have along the way. And... Honestly, from my experience, that is not the case. That is the case for some fantasy authors, but remember, writing a D&D campaign isn't writing a novel. You're not writing a book. You are creating a world that a bunch of other people are gonna make decisions in. So the most important thing you can do is to give them a very detailed, very rich world that those actions and those events that they do will matter in. And to me, that means you can start with pretty much anything. And you don't have to have it all figured out to begin with either. You can make up a lot of detail as you go. You can fill out the world with extra details and cities and places and locations. All of this stuff can be stuff you develop over time. All it needs is an idea. One thing to get that ball of questions in your head rolling. Once you've got that, it's just a case of filling out the details. Once you've got that idea, once you've started the ball rolling on those questions and you're coming up with more and more things, you're on your way to creating that world. One thing which might be worthwhile you doing while you're in that initial idea stage is start to think in a bigger scope. Um, once you've kind of got the ball rolling, you're starting to ask yourself questions. What I find is very useful is to come up with something uh, called key features and the dungeon master's guide for, for play dungeons dragons fifth edition talks about this as well think about the milestones the key headers the key things which make your world different we're going to talk about those and we'll go over some examples now okay so with the polarizing lens i've adjusted my lighting this should be easier to see I'm going to keep using the whiteboard because I like it. It makes me feel like a teacher and it, I think it adds a little bit of something different to the video as well. So, uh, we've talked a little bit about the big idea. We've talked about the thing which might spark that particular campaign, whether it's a, type, a certain villain or a certain faction or a certain cool event that's taken place, whatever has sparked you to create this campaign and sort of like that key thing which gets you going. The next thing we're going to talk about is something that you as the dungeon master, as the games master, probably want to get into your head before you start writing out more detail. Um, before you start answering some of those questions that that initial idea 
um, might have provided before you start going into detail on some of the more fine detail questions you need to start thinking about what I call the key features or think of it like the unique selling points of your campaign now what do I mean by that well uh, for example you know you might say okay you know I've got this idea for a villain blah 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 but I really want this to be you know I want this to be a, a world where magic is scarce that is a key feature that is a unique selling point that is a kind of thing you need to know before you start developing anything more there's no point you saying well i want the world to be i want magic to be very scarce and very rare and very scary um and then later on you're like yeah there's this kingdom and they just they just throw out magic items because they make so goddamn many obviously it doesn't make sense i don't expect anybody to do that but that's a key thing so your key features are basically sort of one line USPs unique selling points things that make your campaign slash world interesting okay that's what we're really talking about here so it might be that yeah you know this could be things like you know example magic is rare and scary um it's not the most original one, but that's okay. It's just that is a key feature of your world. Magic is rare. Magic is scary. It could be um, the gods walk among us. Okay? Things like this. Things that shape and define some fundamental natures about the world itself. But it can be more specific than this as well. It doesn't just have to be as broad as those two options there. Um, so, can be broad, can be specific. Um, to give you some examples of this one, I'm trying to think here. So, uh, it could be, I'm trying to think. So the Eberron campaign setting created by Keith Baker and Wizards of the Coasts, one of that's kind of unique selling points was, you know, magic is is readily available. Magic is technology, basically. You know, minor conveniences are replaced by magical invention. Um, they have things like lightning trains and airships and lighting, and it's it's got this kind of almost like magic punk feel to it, right? That is a very broad um, uh, key feature. I would say that the Eberron campaign setting also has a more specific key feature, which is that uh, a cold war has brewed amongst the most powerful nations and espionage has become a key factor, right? That's also a unique selling point. That's also a key feature, but it is that little bit more specific. I think you can even go even more granular than that. You could do something like, um, I'm trying to think here, you could do something really specific as in uh, portals, to the Feywild have opened up in every major, yep, that, that'll work, Mark, good, <laughs> city, right? That is an incredibly specific feature to have in your world. Portals to the Feywild have opened up in every major city. But, but that key feature not only provides you with a ton of questions to answer that will help you develop the world, give you additional feedback, give you, you know, things to build detail upon and upon and upon, but it also gives your players something to build from. They might start asking questions like, well, how does that, you know, affect this, this player that I want to create, how does that affect this? You know, you start answering questions like, you start asking questions like, well, how does trade work? Is it friendly? Is it violent? 
you know, what's the deal? Who created these portals? Why did they appear? Etc. 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 These key features, once you write them out, once you've got, a, you know, I would say try and come up with five key features for your campaign world. Find ways that whenever you're creating a location, whenever you're, whenever you're creating a faction, how do these key features affect whatever it is you're trying to create? You know, if you're going to create a major, majocracy, um, a major, uh, majocracy, a magically controlled government um, city, and every city has a portal to the Feywild, how is that government going to capitalize on that? How are the people of that city going to react to that? If you're going to, you know, does this apply to, to enemy nations? Are, are the Feywild, you know, are there wars? Does this allow people to go from one city um, in one place, travel through the Feywild, and attack another city at the heart of their city, bypassing all their defenses? All of these questions can be built around that. If magic is rare and scary, what are the leaders of governments going to think about magic? How are local barons going to react when the players find a magical sword in their land? Probably going to want it because it's either rare or they're going to want to try and get rid of it because it's so terrifying. If the gods walk among us, how does that affect religion? You know, do they turn up at their own sermons? Do they have temples? Are they treated like royalty, like kings? Or are they kind of mistrusted? Que these questions and answers that you're building up from your kind of like original idea, the key features you come up here, this is what world building is all about. World building is not going, I have some wonderful story and I'm going to tell it by creating these specific things that fulfill the story that I want to tell. To me, world building is asking questions and the answers lead to details and more questions. And then as you answer more and more of those questions and as you write them down, as you figure out the details, that is how you create very rich, very full universes full of information. So there you go. We, after talking about these, we're now gonna talk a little bit about world events because this kind of, for me, forms the other foundation of world building, especially for D&D campaigns or GMing uh, tabletop role-playing game campaigns. So we've just talked about the key features, your unique selling points and your major idea that might spark the kind of thing to get you started on this campaign process. But what's the next step? Well, if you've got those ideas, those kind of main sort of big headers that you can kind of develop things from, it's time to start thinking more detail. We talked a little bit about asking questions um, and how those answers will, you know, begin to shape the details of the world. One thing I like to do, and one of the early things I work on, which helps me form the foundations of a campaign, is thinking about major world events. Now, what I'm talking about here is effectively a timeline of the biggest, most important events that have shaped your world to the point that it is currently at before your actual adventures, before your sessions begin. Unless you're playing in a campaign where the players are, you know, brand new frontiersmen in a strange land that has no history or claims or staked on it, which I think would be pretty rare and pretty unusual to do, you are going to have a land that has history. And history is shaped by events. Think about our real world. What are the biggest things that have shaped the way that we live today? Technological advancements, changes in government, wars, natural disasters. All of these things basically lead to huge upheavals in culture, geography, borders, you know, actual people and the way that they develop. These things really do matter and they can breathe that sense of life and depth into that world that a lot of people seem to like don't quite know how to you know convey in their games. The Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th Edition Dungeons and Dragons, I've got it here. Da, da, da. Actually, oh, good old lighting there. Whoa, ghost, spooky ghost. Um, the Dungeon Master's Guide for D&D 5th Edition actually has a whole chapter on this. It's on page 27, it begins. They call it campaign events. But there are tons of ideas in here for things that you could use. The rise and fall of a leader or an era. Um, you've got cataclysmic disasters. 
assaults or invasions, rebellions, revolutions, uh, extinctions, new organizations, discoveries, expansion, invention, um, omens, prophecies, and myths and legends. All of those things are really good, and I highly recommend having a read through of that chapter if you've not done so already. Because those world events, these big sort of bucket items, these you know header items, they will not only spark more questions that you can detail out, which will add that richness of lore to your world's history, but they will start giving you plot hooks for down the road when you're writing adventures or magic items and everything else, those little more specific things. How many of these world events should you do? Well, that really depends. I wouldn't say you need to go overboard. You don't need to do 3,000 years worth of you know, every little major event that's happened. You know, it doesn't need to be real world history. You're not a published author. You're not, you know, trying to create, you know, a, a world's history, a, a you know, a, an encyclopedia here. What you're trying to do is create yourself major events that help you structure the way the world has changed. What I would say is off the top of my head, when I think about the sort of things I do, anywhere between... I would say eight to maybe 15 or 16 major events throughout history. You could do less, um, but if you do do less, I would suggest making your world quite new um, because it wouldn't really make sense that you would have such a long period. Or, no, let me change that. If you do have less, either make your world quite new or have a good reason why history hasn't changed much. Um, an example of this that I did was for the High Rollers Lightfall campaign, there was a, you know, magical comet that passed through every hundred years and it blessed the land that made it so that disease was really difficult, that undead and monsters, you know, basically couldn't be awoken, so they didn't really threaten the populace. Um, it made the people happy, it helped grow food, and really that lasted, I think I had it last for like 1200 years. That means that really there was no cause for conflict. Um, there were no natural disasters. There were no invasions. There were no wars, that sort of thing, because everybody had what they needed. That was my kind of excuse for not anything really changing, um, which is a good way of preventing from technology of advancing too far forward, um, kind of having people rely on certain things, etc., etc. So that's one thing to think about um, in terms of just sheer numbers. Um, just trying to think really, one piece of advice I would give you though, and the DMG backs me up on this, um, is to have a major event happen just before the campaign begins. So if you think your timeline, you've got like world creation, and then this is where the player characters start going on their adventures, I would have a major event happen really close. Um, the reason for this is because Having a major event so close to the campaign beginning, A, gives an event that your characters might want to include in their backstories, they might want to have their characters you know, influenced by, or they can ask questions about how they dealt with it, um, and that can help them develop their character a little bit further. But it also provides a driving force for the campaign. Think about the gold rush of America. Um, when it became, when it was discovered that this particular land was rich in this very valuable resource, it sparked everybody to get up and go there and they built towns and they had problems with banditry and they had all these different issues going on, but it kind of created this surge of activity and that's what you're looking for. You know, if you have a new tyrannical government take over the major landscapes um, of your campaign setting, boom, suddenly your characters might be, well, we want to be rebels, we want to be trying to fight against the tyranny. Maybe they're agents of the tyrannical lords who are beginning to question things. All of these things provide more questions, more possibilities that you can then build on later. So it provides that driving onus, that driving force um, to keep things shook up. The DMG is, says another thing about world events, which I happen to agree with, and that is that you should have something, you should have another major event take place in the middle of the campaign, and then another major event happen near the end of the campaign. The reason for this is if the players are just going on the same types of adventures, dealing with the same types of villains, it can get boring pretty quickly. If you change things up, if they get to the midway through the campaign and the world is suddenly invaded, that creates a huge change in dynamic that can actually lead to you know 
a change in gameplay uh, or uh, game pacing, etc. If there's a new discovery, a new technology, a new god, all of these things can really shake stuff up and make your world seem a bit more lively and a bit more interesting. So there you go, that's talking about world events. Related to this, and the last topic I'm going to talk about today is the creation myth. This one's important, basically, on your timeline, this is going to be number one. I think it's particularly useful, um, especially if you've got things like gods and magic in your campaign. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today is the creation myth. I'm sure most of you know this already, but just in case there's a few people don't. A creation myth is the legend or tale or sometimes to some people scientifically proven or just believed in creation of the world itself. Um, so how the world was actually formed, how life came to be, how magic was introduced, all of this stuff, uh, especially for Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, can be very useful to have figured out. Maybe not in full detail, but having a good idea of it. Now, very much like the real world, uh, it often makes sense to have different creation myths believed by different groups of people. Um, not only does this increase conflict, but it also relates into different factions and different factors. You know, if you've got gods who actually give their power to mortals to run around and do things, it makes sense that your gods might have one version of a creation myth, and they say, well, we created the world, and we gave magic, and we did this. You could, however, also say, well, actually, the gods came to this planet, and it was actually formed by the dragons. And the dragons believe that they created the world and then the gods came down and they, you know, invaded or, you know, they, they took responsibility for it or whatever. You could have scholars and scientists and academics say, well, actually, we think that the dragons were here long before then and that the world was created by blah, 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 blah. The reason to have this down, the reason to think about the creation myth, especially as that first world event on the timeline, is because... It's something which can lead to more content down the road. So you can have, you know, religious wars break out between the gods who are arguing about who's the most powerful because so-and-so say they created the world and so-and-so say they created the world, blah, blah, blah. But it can also lead to, you know, adventure locations. Maybe there is a, you know, an ancient temple that predates the gods' arrival on the planet. Or maybe it predates the most ancient dragon fossils that have been found. Who created the temple? What was it created for? Blah, 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 blah. Those things can all give you really interesting ideas. And it is also something that is just good to know. People want to believe that the world wasn't just created randomly, that there's purposes and, and you know reasons behind things. Um, and in a world where, yeah, magic is real and the gods have a physical manifestation um, and powers and things like that, it is definitely worth considering about. It doesn't need to be particularly complicated. And honestly, the creation myth, anything really goes. You can have people believe the most audacious, crazy mental theories you can think about. Or you can have really reasonable ones, you know. Uh, to give an example of this in a current new project I'm working on, um, there is one unified creation myth believed because the gods are very real. They've spent time with mortals and they've gone, yeah, this is this is how it was made. This is the truth of it. Um, and th that's what I wanted to do. You don't have to follow these rules. You don't have to make it a big, you know, conflict driven deal. But it's worth thinking about as that first event on that world events timeline you're going to be building out. Uh, that is pretty much it for this episode of DM 101. Hopefully, once again, it has been useful to you. Next episode, we'll probably talk about more world creation stuff. So tune in for that. Thank you very much for all the support and feedback so far. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video. Don't forget to click the little bell for notifications um, on when a video is uploaded. You can also check me out on Twitch. Uh, I stream pretty regularly at the moment on uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Twitch.tv forward slash Tabletop Weekly. Uh, you can also check me out on Patreon, where I post some more D&D homebrew stuff as well. Um, and yeah, don't forget to check out all of those places. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.